Good morning, everyone. Thank you to BSP uh, for allowing us to share our research here at the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Uh, the paper I will be presenting is a paper I co-wrote with um, John Paul Corpus, a supervising research uh, specialist here at PIDS. And uh, we have a different name now for our paper. Uh, and we uh, called it uh, Understanding and Measuring Financial Inclusion in the Philippines. Okay, so what is the motivation? Why did we study financial inclusion? Uh, well, for its benefits, uh, financial inclusion helps individuals as well as small businesses invest for the future. It helps smooth consumption. It helps households and small businesses to manage their finances. And therefore, it can help uh, enhance productivity and long-term growth and potentially help reduce poverty and inequality. So this is what we see in the literature, literature as we have cited in our slide. It's a timely topic because according to new research, financial inclusion can mitigate uh, the detrimental effect of inequality on poverty. So in, in a new paper, Gutierrez, Romero and Ahmed, they uh, tried to forecast uh, what will happen to poverty in COVID and they saw extreme poverty will rise. But they also said, well, well, you, there is a, uh, something you can do and so that something is uh, uh, financial inclusion. It, they believe that financial inclusion can also help substantially lessen the harsh effects of the pandemic. We also saw a research gap uh, in the literature because despite the interest in the area, uh, we know that financial inclusion is uh, front and center, uh, for instance, uh, at the BSP, uh, there is uh, still room for us to, to do our studies uh, because there is still quite limited research in terms of the relationship between inclusion and such things as growth and development and financial stability and uh, even monetary policy making especially when you're talking about subnational, uh, uh, national and subnational levels, because most of the studies that are out there are mostly cross-country studies. So we have a three-in-one, <laughs> Kape, uh, we have three-in-one uh, research paper. Uh, we have three research questions. Number one, how, how does the Philippines compare with other countries in terms of developing uh, uh, with other countries, sorry, in developing Asia in terms of financial inclusion. What are the stylized uh, facts of financial inclusion in the Philippines? And number three, how do we construct a measure of uh, financial uh, inclusion in the Philippines, given that uh, it's hard to measure, it's a multidimensional concept. So how do we now go about doing it? So I'll go very quickly, question number one, how does the country fare in the context of developing Asia? I look at different, uh, we look at different databases globally. Uh, we have your global microscope, which was mentioned by uh, Dr. Uh, Professor, um, Governor Jock, no? Um, I, I have known him from so many uh, uh, um, iterations. So Governor Jokna, uh, so there's the Global Microscope from EIU 2020, IMF Financial Access Survey 2019, uh, World Bank Global Findex uh, 2017. So what do we find here is that, yeah, the Philippines leads the region in terms of enabling environment for financial inclusion. And we are particularly strong in terms of stability and integrity, products and outlets, even government and policy, and to a certain extent also consumer protection. But we are quite challenged in terms of infrastructure, We're referring to payments infrastructure and the, the perennial problem of internet connectivity, digital um, IDs um, and credit information. But while we are very strong in these areas, the country has mixed performance in terms of financial outreach. So this is from the IMF uh, Financial Access Survey. So when we look at geographic penetration, so it's the number of branches or units uh, per uh, thousand square kilometers, we are about middle of the pack there. But we when we look at demographic penetration, we are a bit challenged in this area. Uh, comparing ourselves with other countries uh, in uh, the Southeast Asian region, for example. Um, we also lag a bit in terms of ownership of financial accounts. So again, comparing ourselves with the other economies in the region, we are a bit challenged in terms of ownership in a basic account, uh, 
debit card ownership, credit card ownership, but middle of the pack in terms of mobile money account ownership. Um, same pattern in usage of financial services. We are a bit challenged in terms of formal saving, formal credit, uh, um, the what remittances through financial institutions, online payments or purchases, but uh, middle of the pack in terms of uh, mobile phone transactions. Now, when we look at the reasons given by those who are financially excluded in the country, there are both voluntary and involuntary reasons. Voluntary reasons are reasons uh, that are sort of uh, the choice of the person. Uh, so they, they may choose not to be uh, included for this is what they want. Involuntary reason is more of like there's a barrier that is preventing them from being inc um, included. And so if you look at again at the other Asian economies, it's color green. So voluntary are color green. I uh, color coded this. But when we look at the Philippines and uh, the nearest one is Indonesia, uh, many of the reasons given are involuntary in nature, such as uh, saying that it's too expensive to own a, an account. It's uh, I lack documents. I can't open an account or the or the financial institution is too far away. So strong points and uh, points that we need uh, to work on. Um, number two question, what are the stylized facts of financial inclusion in the Philippines? So this is something we need to know. We need to understand the phenomenon if we want to make more headway in terms of policy. So what we did here is we analyzed the available microdata on the Philippines. Uh, this one is from, um, we used the one from the World Bank, uh, World Bank Findex 2017. So yeah, it's a bit dated, but we are expecting new data from them uh, well next year. So for the meantime, I think this is a, a good enough um, database to use. Um, so as in any research uh, venture, you have to acknowledge everybody who came before you. So in this case, we have Demigurg Content Clapper uh, from the World Bank. They highlighted that national development drives differences in account penetration across countries, while personal income level drives differences in account penetration across individuals within countries. So the importance of income is very clear in their study. The second uh, important paper is by Allen et al, uh, 2016. They examined what they called the foundations of financial inclusion, and says so they basically looked at individual and country characteristics and they noted that the efficacy of national policies to promote financial inclusion depended on individual characteristics within a country. We also um, um, looked at Fungakova and Wheel. This is a paper on China, but uh, they uh, underscored the concept of involuntary exclusion, which we liked, which they also got actually from the seminal work of Allen, where uh, involuntary exclusion the reasons given for not owning an account may be due to a market failure or maybe a barrier that is preventable and therefore can be addressed through suitable policy. So the last set of studies we looked at is, of course, our very own uh, 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 Dr. Lianto studies, um, where, which were published in the Philippine Review of Economics in 2015 and with Lianto and Rizalion 2017 at PIDS. And they were similarly motivated, like we were, by the observed challenges to further expansion of outreach and usage in the Philippines, despite financial inclusion being top of the agenda. And they found significantly positive relationships between household and individual access and use of financial services and different socioeconomic characteristics, which uh, I'm sure was very helpful in the construction of policy. Now, in terms of empirical method, uh, I will not dwell on this, uh, same as Dr. Laura, uh, time constraints. So suffice it to say that we used a series of probit regressions single probit uh, and joint probit, probit whenever it was needed. A joint probit for those who are interested in econometrics is really like your Heckman two-step approach, except we can't use that here because our second step is also a binary. We have a dependent variable that's also binary. So it's also a, a qualitative regression. So we just use joint probit as estimation in those cases. So we use probit estimation to estimate uh, probability of owning an account. 
So we looked at four regressions, one for formal account, one for debit card, one for mobile money account, and another for credit card. And then joint probe for account use because you have to own an account before you can use it. So we used, uh, uh, we, uh, our dependent variables were saving, formal saving, formal credit, uh, domestic remittances through a financial institution, um, um, the fintech uh, element, uh, mobile phone transactions, and online transactions. And then we also looked at alternative sources of borrowing. So dependent variables there are related borrowing, meaning borrowing from family or friends, borrowing from informal savings groups, and borrowing from all sources. And then finally, which is like the meat of the paper, we looked at the probability of of the reasons that were cited and we talked about them earlier four are voluntary in nature meaning uh, they reflect voluntary exclusion and the other four are involuntary for this for all the regressions we have the same set of independent variables pertaining to age sex education employment income and geographic area now the important thing i just like to note in the regressor is i colored uh, orange uh, those are your base categories. So that's the, again, for those who like econometrics, that's the dummy variable you drop. So you don't fall into a dummy trap. And so that becomes your benchmark when you are making your analysis. Okay, we will see that more clearly later. And again, we use the World Bank Global Findex, which we like because it has a fintech angle. Okay, so now we look at the, the regressions. Sorry, I cannot move. Um, so this this represents the 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 results of the first two regressions on formal account and uh, debit card. Okay, so the blue bars are for refer to formal accounts, and the green bars uh, refer to debit card uh, regressions. Okay, so a formal account regression blue debit card uh, debit card regression green if it's hollow uh, so you're spared the econometrics so you just get the results financial inclusion we found is more likely if one is richer more educated wage employed female or older up to retirement and middle age respectively now the thing uh, well it may be it may not be really new results but uh I'd like to think uh, we did it in a way that uh, allowed us to get uh, little details like when when does the uh, financial inclusion uh, taper and so we were able to um, compute the ages when they happen and we found that for basic accounts it usually tapers around retirement age and we're talking about formal credit it tapers around the age of 50. Okay, so it's it's quite useful I, I think information for the private sector and the public sector. One uh, other takeaway from our regressions was that fintech in the form of mobile money seems most promising with seemingly the most equitable access among the different forms of financial inclusion. Now I say most promising because this data remember was 2017. And so we had a small uh, sample there and I'm guessing that by now this would be already uh, totally uh, uh, a solid result by now, okay, especially after the, during and after the pandemic. Um, in analyzing the barriers uh, to financial account ownership, we found that involuntary exclusion of some underserved sectors were apparent. And uh, this means that the reasons why they don't have an account refer to things like cost, banking, uh, cost, uh, distance of the bank, um, uh, those kinds of, of reasons, which, has, uh, we can, which can be adjusted by policy. Um, formal credit remains underdeveloped. That is a very clear result uh, in our um, paper. But empirical results suggest that improvement in education, aside from income and employment, could allow better access to formal borrowing sources. Now, this is actually the meat of the, of the paper. It's really uh, coming up with an index because that is the key that will unlock other research areas. Okay, so I think um, a, a lot of our great predecessors have already done a lot in terms of trying to understand uh, the phenomenon. But if we get that measure, we're able to unlock things like how does financial inclusion affect growth in the Philippines? How does it affect um, poverty? How does it affect inequality? How does it affect financial stability, most importantly, uh, more importantly? 
uh, well, equally importantly, and how does it affect, affect monetary policy? So this is just a literature review. I'd just like to highlight that, no, we did not enter in this field and just, uh, you know, uh, uh, we do acknowledge a lot of people who came before us, but especially I'd like to acknowledge the young BSP researchers who have done most of the work here. Uh, in, if you look at Philippine studies, uh, one of the main studies there is by Minard Mojica, who, who uh, was very kind enough to help us with the data. He's with CLI at uh, BSP and our own national statistician, Dennis Mapa. So they were able to construct, construct an index, came out in a Philippine statistician 2017. And I think Tan, uh, I think her name is Tatum Tan, uh, is also from BSP 2014. So they both uh, used non-parametric methods and created cross-section indicators for Philippine provinces and regions, respectively. And Rosvern Reyes, also from BSP, who generated a regional index using different techniques and was able to create panel data for the years 2005 to 2016. Now, I know about Rosvern's paper because I was the reader for his master's thesis, so commercial lang. Uh, um, the challenge is fine. I, I'll spare you the econometrics, but I'll just say that we did it in a way that was uh, sort of going um, cutting edge, going towards the cutting edge, uh, go, reaching for something publishable. And so we have an index that sort of take, makes use of the modern uh, technology techniques, but we try to clean up the conceptualization. So we have, we hope we have clearer um, uh, definitions for outreach and usage, etc. So for this uh, forum, what I'd like to show is despite everything that we've done in order to get the cleanest measure we could given the data that we were given, uh, thanks to BSP, they gave us the data, we find that there's still a really wide gap between NCR and the rest of the regions and between the rest of the regions and BARM. So consistently on top are NCR, Central Visayas, and Calabar Zone, and some consistently uh, lagging our BARM and Eastern Messiah. So despite all the econometrics we did. Now we did the micro data uh, analysis and we expect these correlations, okay? We expect the index to be positively correlated with things that are positively correlated with education and income. Okay, we said education and income are the barriers. So when we look at the index, we want it uh, to validate it, it should be positively correlated. So it does, it does seem to be that way. The index is positively correlated with regional output. It's positively correlated with regional literacy. It's positively correlated with uh, having electricity. It's negatively correlated with, with lower poverty. And the nice thing here is, uh, is this is something that we did not have an a priori expectation of. It turns out it's also negatively correlated to inequality, meaning it uh, it comes with lower inequality. And we tried to validate it against the FIES and we also were able to validate it. So going to the conclusions of our study, um, the stylized facts offer obvious policy levers such as raising education levels in the country and creating broader programs to improve math and financial literacy, including in the adult population. Now, it may sound like an old, you know, uh, tune being sung all over again, but what I'd like uh, extra to emphasize here is, is the importance of math. Okay, I've taught uh, financial economics at UP for a long time, and I do know that you need to have math really for people to really understand finance. Okay, and we need it at the functional level, even uh, 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 at the basic level, uh, meaning from basic education. Um, so financial educa education has been shown to raise financial inclusion and therefore financial education can be an important instrument of financial development. Okay, this is according to Groman, Kluse, and Menkoff. Uh, what I also would like to highlight are the potential undesired generational effects where the elderly may be shut out of the formal financial sector for various reasons, including unfamiliarity with financial services, which further underscore the need for intervention. So it's a, it's a, a nonlinear relationship with age. So you have two ex excluded segments, the young and the old. And we're trying, I hope we can take care of the young through education and the old through some kind of remedial um, adult education. 
research has suggested, so I am responding already to Dr. Lianto here, here, research has suggested that targeting the financially excluded by encouraging basic or low-fee accounts and correspondent banking, as well as consumer protection policies and use of G2P payments by government may be effective strategies for greater financial participation. And yeah, I, I to acknowledge that such policies already being pursued by the BSP. So I, I re actually read the whole book, the Nobody Left Behind book. And so I guess I have another to add to my reading list, which is the ADB book that um, Dr. Lianto is recommending. <clears throat> the silver lining of the pandemic is that it has sped up the implementation of the national ID system. And uh, this is very helpful in terms of removing the barriers to banking in terms of documentation, uh, removing the barriers to getting financial services. Uh, FinTech, now this is me just raising a warning because uh, um, FinTech uh, does seem tailor-made to address the hurdles to financial inclusion because it targets the main uh, um, areas that are being raised, uh, like uh, distance from a, from a financial institution, cost of uh, having an account, having no documentation, etc. But we should also remember that uh, economic history has shown that whenever there's financial innovation and liberalization, it always comes with a set of risks. So there's always a warning. Uh, and I know our regulators are very good at this, but democratization of credit in the US led to credit card uh, debt and bankruptcies. Similar democratization of housing finance also in the US created derivatives, led to the creation of derivatives leading to the global financial crisis, etc. So with today's environment serving as a breeding ground for risk, lawmakers and regulators will need to continuously strike an optimal regulatory balance to foster both inclusion and stability. So there has to be a middle ground. And uh, I believe that this requires deeper understanding of the new financial products, services, technologies, and markets that may emerge. So in the pandemic, a lot of uh, you know, new ideas uh, suddenly emerged. And we have to understand this, as well as the behavior of the new players and their clients. Think Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, et cetera. We have uh, uh, a duty now to understand them. So ultimately, uh, we believe more research is needed here uh, uh, at PIDS. Uh, measuring financial inclusion at the subnational level, uh, I think is a first step uh, that we are making to further study other issues, not just the important causal link between financial inclusion and growth and development, if there are, if there are any, but also the important link between financial inclusion and financial stability and even uh, monetary policy. Thank you for giving me some time. Um, 